Hi everyone. Uh, I wanted to share today um, uh, some thoughts that, that were bouncing around as we we're trying to figure out what should go in GHC 2021, right? So the GHC steering committee is right now working on figuring out a set of extensions that should be sort of enabled by default um, in, I think it'll end up in GHC 9.2. Um, and, and one question that came up was around role annotations and generalized new type deriving. And so uh, today's video is about how uh, these features might be considered unsafe and maybe they shouldn't be on by default, maybe they should, I don't know, uh, but we're going to sort of explore the safety issues around, around these features. Um, so it all starts from uh, thinking about abstract types, right? We, we like to have uh, some types in, in our programs to be abstract so that they can store information in a way that maintains invariance. So, so here up on the screen, um, we have a set type, and it's a very naive set type, so let's not get distracted by how inefficient it is. That's not the point of, of, of today's video. It's, I wanted to keep something simple. Um, so, so here we have a set, and it's just going to represent a set of elements by a list, uh, but with two invariants. So one invariant is that all of the elements in this list are going to be in increasing order, um, and there are no duplicates. Um, and uh, somewhat unusually, I'm just going to have deriving show here because we're going to want to be able to see these sets uh, as we as we look at examples. Um, uh, if, of course, if we were really abstract, we wouldn't just use deriving show. Um, and and there's a few. Uh, uh, yeah, basic operations on sets, we can have an empty set, we can make a unit set containing one element, we can union two sets, uh, we can check to see whether an element is in a set, and we can delete from a set. Um, again, uh, the implementations here aren't the interesting part. You can look at that. Uh, maybe there's errors. I hope not. That would be embarrassing, but but whatever. Let's just move past that. That's not the point. Um, so uh, so here's, here's our, our data type. Now let's look at a client of this data type. So we're going to switch over to another module. Um, oh, and by the way, I should have said this earlier. Um, the code that we're looking at is posted online. There's a link in the description, um, uh, but there's a, a spot for some. Sometimes when I have a video that has some more developed code, I, I put it in this repo. It's going to be linked in the description. Um, so let's look at, at our other file. Our other file is, is fairly short, so let's load that up. Um, and, and here uh, I have a function from list that allows us to convert a list into a set. Um, this is defined outside of the set module because it doesn't actually need access to the internal representation. Um, but the idea is, is that all of the functions in the set module presumably uphold those invariants. So, so let's look at, at, at some examples here. So if I say from, let's do let s equal from list of 5, 3, 1, 8, 3 again, 6, 1 again, 9. Um, so if I look at s, uh, the internal representation, again, this is meant to be abstract, but we want to see what's going on under the hood a little bit here. Um, so here it's going to store this list, and we see that it has the unique elements um, from my initial declaration here, uh, uh, but sorted into order. So now we can do nice things, like we can say is 5, is that in the set, in set S? Oh, yes, it is. Is 7 in set S? Oh, no, it's not. Um, uh, so that's all good. And... In fact, we can delete from the set. And so we can say s delete 3, and we see that 3 is missing. And sure enough, if I ask, is 3 in that set? No, no, 3 is not in that set. We've just deleted it. Um, OK, so, so this is all working quite nicely. Um, but now, uh, let's look at this definition uh, down here. So here, I have a, a type parity. Um, which stores an integer, but when we do equality and or and, and, and ORD comparisons, we only care whether the integer is even or odd. Um, so really, this parity type, uh, we can think of it only has really two elements, but maybe we want to store some extra information somehow. Uh, so the key thing here is that we have a type that is representationally equal to integer. That's what new type means, right? That parity at runtime is just going to be an integer, no extra gubbins at runtime. Um, but yet we can change the way it behaves under some class-based operations. So here the eek instance and the ORD instance for parity is different than that for integer, and that's, and that's really the key bit. Um, so if I create a, a, a list of parodies here, um, so now I can say let sp equal from list of 
P1 and P4 and P5 and P2 and P1 again and P8, right? P here is the, is the constructor for parity if you look up. Um, and if I build this, that's fine. And I can ask what's in SP. Well, it just has P1 and P8. Uh, why 8 and not 4 or 2? I don't know. It doesn't really matter in the end. Um, uh, because the idea is, is that these 4 and 2 and 8 are all equal with respect to the eek instance. So the algorithm that builds the set, it, it happens to choose 1 and 8. Uh, that's fine. Um, and, and then, you know, all of these operations are going to work. The problem is, is that here, when I said that parity is a new type wrapping integer, that means that parity integer have the same runtime representation. So modern Haskell has a feature called coerce, which allows us to, for, to, to, to make a conversion between representationally equal types for free. So what I can actually do is I can say let sp2 equals coerce of s. Um, but I have to put a type annotation there. This is going to be a set of parity. And, and all that does is that does no action at all at runtime. It just does a little type change. So now if I look at sp2, oh, now we're in trouble. Because all it did is it took s um, and it wrapped each element in, in the list contained within s uh, with the p constructor. And this is problematic because now my sp2, it violates the invariance on the set type. And we can, we can see this violation by, by playing around with it. So in particular, if I say, um, if I ask the question, is 5 in the set sp2 delete 5? Surely the answer should be no. But it'll be true here, right? Because if I look at sp2 delete p5, then um, it will delete the first thing that is equal to 5, which is 1. So it does do a deletion, but because we violated the, inv the, the representation invariance of a set, uh, we, we end up our operations no longer work. The assumptions that we make when writing our functions are no longer true, and we end up in trouble. This is no good. Um, and and so, uh, so this, this doesn't work. Now, you might think, let's go back to our, our set module. You might think, oh, well, you know, this, this clearly isn't an abstract type. But actually, when I've exported, notice this elements constructor. It's really not exported. I can't access it. Um, the problem here is that this coerce mechanism is based on, on this idea called roles. And the idea of a role is it tells us sort of whether or not we can lift a, a representational equality through a type. Um, so let me actually go back out to the other file, and, and I'll explain this a little bit. So this all comes down to equality relations. By saying parity is a new type around integer, we get the fact that parity is representationally equal to integer. So I'm going to write representational equality using twiddle, which is Haskell's normal uh, equality notation. Uh, but I'm going to use an R. These two types are not twiddle in the normal Haskell sign, but they are representationally equal. They look the same at runtime. And what roles do is allow us to lift an equality. So uh, a good thing that, that, that we can do with roles is it allows, it allows us to say that for all A and B, if A is representationally equal to B, then that implies that maybe A is representationally equal to maybe B. For all A and B, if A is representationally equal to B, then a list of A is representationally equal to a list of b. These are good things. This allows us to make to write more efficient programs because if we use a new type, instead of converting, let's say we have a list, not a set, but a list of these parities, we want to convert it to a list of integers, we can do that with taking no steps at all at runtime. We don't have to rebuild the list. We just can change the type using coerce. Um, so, so now it's worth explaining a little bit more of how this relates to coerce. So the coerce function has this type. It has type coercible a, b, a to b. Um, coercible is really the same as twiddle r. But I'm going to continue to use twiddle r because it has a nice infix notation and it's quite a bit shorter than coercible. So our problem is that set is that we have for all a, b, a representationally equal to b implies set a 
is representationally equal to set B. And that's the problem. Um, right? We don't really want this, right? Because even though int is representationally equal to parity, once we wrap up in a set, now we're in trouble. We can't, we can't make this change without violating our class-based invariants. Um, so if we look at if we look here, the solution to this problem is to declare that this argument A, this parameter to the data type set, is what, what we say has a nominal role. And that means that only when we have when we have um, two sets that have the exact same argument are they representationally equal. So the notation for this is to say type role set nominal. Uh, and we're going to need the role annotations extension to do that. And now we can compile this. And then now that I've done this, if I go back here, whoops, uh, I need to go into the use and load use. Um, if I go up and let's redefine, where is it? Set S and then now try to define SP. No, no, no. This doesn't work. Um, no instance for num parity arising from a oh haha -ha, s it must be generalized um i meant s to have um have type integer let's let's hold on let's just get you the better error message we want good error messages so let's say this is a set of integer and then now if i do this ah can't match integer with parity and that's exactly the right thing because here by by writing type role set nominal we're saying that we can only coerce between one set and another if their arguments are exactly the same it's not the normal sort of loose representation thing in the in the in this implication language that i've been writing our solution instead of our problem now says for all a b if a twiddle b whoops then set a is representationally equal to set b in other words a and b have to really be the same type um, and so that solves our problem. And the reason for this is that the class mechanism uses what's called nominal equality, not representational equality. If the class-based mechanism used representational equality, then we couldn't have separate instances for parity as we do for integer, right? They would be considered overlapping. Instead, when we think about overlapping instances, we say, are these the same type? Well, no, parity and integer are different types. Um, and so that's what allows us to write these instances. So as soon as we invoke a class-based invariant, we really need to write this role annotation here. So if, there, if that's sort of one thing to take away, that's the thing, right? As soon as you have a class-based invariant, we talk about ord instance here, and I didn't write it out, but by saying no duplicates, that's based on an eek instance. As soon as we do that, we also need this role annotation. Now, Going back to where we started, is, is, should we consider these features safe or unsafe or violating abstractions? Well, it sort of depends on our level of expectation of Haskell programmers, right? We kind of expect Haskell programmers to know that if they want an abstract type, they can't export the constructor. So here, my original module exported set the type, but not the elements constructor. And, and so we expect everyone to know that. Do we expect people to know to write a role annotation also to ensure abs the abstractness of a type? Mm, that's a that's a bit of a harder ask, um, and I don't I don't know about that. But I do know that if we if we want if we are choosing these defaults these default extensions to be allowed, if we're going to say that generalized new type deriving, which is built on type of coerce, if we're going to say that coerce is safe, then we should probably include role annotations. But is role annotations too advanced? I don't know. It's a good question. I don't have a good answer there. Um, but anyway, I hope that this has been enlightening. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.